That's the way you do it, huh? Roll it and they come out. Hello, it's time for June's wrap up video. Normally I have my little wrap up game that I play to speed things up, make things more efficient. I love my wrap up game and it's not going anywhere, but there is no wrap up game this month because this month I was mood reading and I didn't know what that was gonna look like. I didn't know what I was gonna get through and I wanted to be able to say, this is what I read because I really didn't have a full TBR for my TBR video. So let's find out what I read. Some of the things are gonna look very familiar to you. I do wanna say first off that while I'm filming this, it is the 27th of June, so I have a couple of days left and I do have some books that are still on the go pretty sure I'll finish them. No big deal. If not, they'll just roll over into July. July and August, I think, is just kind of one kind of fluid month. I'll still do a TBR for August. I always do a TBR, but I think a lot of the books that I don't get to in July, I'm just going to roll over into August. And if I don't finish these in June, I will finish them in July. So those are a beastly kind of Earl, which has made it onto multiple <laughs> TBRs and until now has never actually gotten read. So I'm glad I'm finally reading this. I only have like 80-ish pages left, so probably finish that today. Trials of the Earth. This is a TBR veteran for me. I'm so glad I finally picked it up. I'm not quite done with it yet, but I probably will finish it tomorrow. And then I have on a Libby, uh, Miss Eliza's English Kitchen, which is phenomenal. I'm loving it so much, but I am definitely not going to finish it in the next couple of days. And I also was hoping it's on my TBR. I'll just go ahead and put it here. I will read it in July. There's no way that I won't, but um, Ruth Wears Zero Days. My hold came in for that. So uh, those are on the go. They are on the go, and I just wanted to mention them. They were started in June. They'll probably be finished maybe in June, but most likely in July. Then I had some books that I needed to read. These were not mood reads, were for the Read Harder Challenge, the Book Riot Read Harder Challenge. The first one was for the cookbook option. And so I picked another TBR veteran, Lunch in Paris, a love story with recipes by Elizabeth Bard. And this was a meh read for me, so I won't say much about it. Uh, then I read for the BIPOC history, I read Walking in the Sacred Manor. So what it is is a collection of interviews and stories and things and kind of collated uh, into something that's kind of cohesive, but each chapter maybe stands on its own. They inform each other, but you could just, if you're a researcher or something, you could just dive into the one chapter that is of interest to you. Um, and it was a very diverse collection for each topic and each topic related directly to the role of women in Native American spiritualism, but also community life. I, in the end, felt that it was too, like to give it a rating was to rate culture and I wasn't going to do that. So I didn't give this a rating, but I really enjoyed it. And if you are curious or interested um, in the content, go ahead and pick that up. Then I read um, for the 12 and 12 challenge. My Facebook friend recommended The Disappearing Spoon. This was fun. It was about the periodic table and how and a different like story or small set of vignettes brought about each of the different elements on the periodic table. Entertaining and not really my thing. <laughs> so I'm glad I read it. I'm glad I read it again my 12 and 12 challenge. This was my Instagram friends, Quiet um, by Susan Cain. I'd heard a lot about this. I think maybe that did it a disservice for me because I felt like there wasn't any new information in it. I'm sure when it was first released, most of the information was very new. But by the time I got to it, it was a lot of 
qualitative information that was interesting. It was fine and I skimmed most of it to be perfectly honest. So there was that. And then for my book of the month book choice, I read The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Bramer. And this was just excellent. I absolutely love this book. Uh, this was about a deaf doula. She helps people prepare to leave the world and that looks different for every situation and it's the story of how she got into this work and it's the story of how she kind of gets stuck in this identity and persona um like this cocoon of protection of not having to really get to know anybody for a long period of time because the people who she spends the majority of her time with are all on their way out and how things just kind of change and it was so good at talking about different ways that different kinds of grief impact different kinds of people i'm going to talk about the series that i made progress in and then we'll get into the mood reading so I reread The Moon by Night, which is uh, the second book in the Austin Family Chronicles. This has always been my favorite of the series, and it remains my favorite of the series. Uh, there, It's about Vicki Austin and her family, and this time, instead of taking in a girl who has just gone through the loss of her parents, uh, they are taking a family road trip across the United States. And they're staying, they're camping the whole time, and they're staying in national parks. And uh, it is just really, really fun. There's there's the whole family dynamic stuff, which is awesome. And then there's the added element of Vicky's growing up and she attracts along the way, she attracts these two suitors uh, who couldn't be more different from each other day and night. They kind of are both pursuing her through the story, which is fun. And then there's also all of this like growing up stuff and realizing that the world is a harsh place. She goes, she gets taken to go see uh, the diary of Anne Frank and it really impacts her. She wasn't aware of everything. And remember this was written in the fifties, sixties. So the character is really incredibly impacted and Frank hasn't permeated the entire culture at this time and um and so it's a really fraught reference for this book for the time that it was written in and for this character who was not completely informed as a 14 year old girl about what a 14 year old girl had gone through just about a decade before her so it was it's very very impactful and wonderful and i love it uh, it's also super super fun super fun uh she even gets they even have um an appearance of the queen of england <laughs> it's it's super fun it's super super fun um yeah if you haven't read the austin family chronicles and you uh love a good family story i highly highly suggest it start at the beginning and work your way all the way through. Um, then I read, I can't believe I'm still on this. I thought I would be tired of them by now, but I'm really not. I read the next book. It was the sixth book in the Outlander series, and it is The Breath of Snow and Ashes. And I am not going to say anything about it, but I did read it. And it this series is, it's, it's consumable. <laughs> It's consumable. The books are so long. They're so long. Um, and I've been listening to them. So I read the first and the second one physically. And then after that, I started listening to them. And that's been perfect. Uh, I listen at three times speed. It's just who I am. And I get through them a lot quicker than if I were reading them myself. But still, but still, they are incredibly quick reads for as long as they are. Um, the, as you know, I think I'm getting immune to all of the disasters <laughs> that occur regularly in these books because I am reading them back to back. I imagine that when that final one finally comes out and I have had some space between me and the final book that has already been released, the final book will be hard to get through, like hard emotionally to get through. But, um, Breath of Snow and Ashes was breaking my heart without breaking my heart, if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I also read the penultimate book in the um, Arcana series by Cressley Cole. One book left, not reading it next month because I'm not reading any series stuff next month uh, because of Jane Austen July and Librarian vs. Librarian, such huge TBR. Uh, but in August, I will be finally finishing the Arcana series. I read the second book in the Seven Sisters series, and that was Storm Sister by Lucinda Riley. And this one was good. I was really into it at the beginning and then kind of lost me in the middle. It got a little boring and then the end was excellent. So I am primed to pick up the next book. But let's talk about mood reading. Let's start with what I read on my Kindle. So the first book that you know about if you watched my TBR, the first book that I picked was Becoming Duchess Goldblatt because it had been on my Kindle for a while, not a super long time, but a while. And I was curious about it. Becoming Duchess Goldblatt is a memoir, but it's a memoir unlike any other memoir I've ever read because it is the memoir of two people. It's the memoir of the invented persona, Duchess Goldblatt, and the person who invents Duchess Goldblatt. The person who invents Duchess Goldblatt remains and is still anonymous. And Duchess Goldblatt is, was, I suppose, I didn't know about her until I, this memoir came into my um, world. Uh, but Duchess Goldblatt had a huge following, maybe has a huge following on Twitter and on other social media platforms uh, because she is a writer and she wanted a, an outlet for certain parts of her personality and she wanted to give hope to the world because she was in a very hopeless spot herself. And Duchess Goldblatt, the creation of this character, kind of saved her. She couldn't quite believe that people were so into it. And yet they were, they are, they formed whole like communities and met each other, married each other through like knowing about Duchess Goldblatt. Just all sorts of stuff happened. The person who invented Duchess Goldblatt herself ends up getting to hang out with, meet, and become actual friends with Lyle Lovett, who she'd been obsessed with her whole life, uh, because Lyle Lovett followed Duchess Goldblatt. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was funny and fun and uh, very, very depressing at times. Incredibly sad. This woman has been in dark places, um, going through divorce and things she went through with her children and things or son and things that she went through with her you know own childhood with her mother um it was not all happiness um and it's a very very well written book it's a very interesting book it's a little bit like you are held at arm's length because you don't know who she is and she wants you at arm's length um but it worked it worked and it was a great kindle read so on this cover the title is written in blue so the next book I picked from my Kindle is, was an ARC that I got from NetGalley that was super excited to read and I connected them because the title is also written in blue and that is, it's Emily Wilde's May of the Other Lands <laughs> by Heather Fawcett. Uh, this is the second in the duology, I believe it's just a duology, of Emily Wilde. I had just read Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies and absolutely, absolutely, absolutely loved it. And this one did not disappoint either. These are fun, lighthearted, romance, adventure, fae stories. Uh, and I don't want to tell you too much about what happens in this one, because a lot of it happens because of things that happened in the first one. And so I just really think that if you are attracted to that at all, it is very twee, it's very whimsy oriented. Uh, and I, it's very um, Howl's Moving Castle-ish, but less dark. Just loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. It's so much fun and highly recommend. Um, and from there, I, so there are foxes on the cover of Emily Wilde. And uh, so I picked that my next book, uh, because this kind of fox that's on this cover is like a fairy fox. And so it's like a mythical creature. And the next person or the person on my next book is also a mythical creature. So, uh, that is Grandma Gatewood's walk. So uh, Emma Gatewood is a woman who after at the age of like after 60, she's in her 60s, 
after having raised kids and worked her whole life and ran a house, she decides that uh, she's seen, I can't remember if it was a photograph in a magazine or a brief thing on television, but she'd seen something about the head of the, like, of the start of the Appalachian Trail. And she was like, I'm going to walk that someday. And so after the age of 60, she just packs up a bunch of stuff, doesn't know what she's doing, puts on some canvas sneakers, takes a bus trip to the, the beginning of the Appalachian Trail and starts to walk it and fails miserably and uh, almost dies and has search parties go out for her. And so then she tries again. She tries again. She's like, okay, I learned from this and I'm going to, I'm going to try it again. I'm going to walk this trail. She ends up walking it from start to finish more than six times, raises awareness about it, basically saves the Appalachian Trail, gets it some attention, um, and makes it like a thing for people to walk it, um, like for more than necessity. She does all of this without any like preparation or training or any kind of anything really except for a, a dream and determination. Grandma Gatewood, she's like this, this biography was so rich with heart and visual imagery. You just really feel like you hear Grandma Gatewood's voice. Loved it. Highly recommend it. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. It was, however, my last Kindle read, but I'm just not picking up my Kindle these days. Like if I'm not reading off of my Kindle in school, because that's where I generally read off of my Kindle, then I'm really not reading my Kindle. Um, I've got it by my bed. I do sometimes get into a mood where I'm like, I you know, want to read before I go to bed and having the lights off and just the Kindle on. It's very cozy. And so I'll read, but I find myself just not, yeah, just not picking up the Kindle. So that's all I read for my Kindle. The next book is going to be the start of my audiobook list. And uh, this was the one that I was able to tell you that I was reading. And so this is the one that the whole domino effect of this book leads to this book leads to this book starts with. Um, that was the memoir, All Things Aside by Eliza Schlesinger. Each of these is like a little essay. They all work together to kind of tell a greater story about an aspect of Eliza's life. But really, they are... <sighs> so many things like an ode to the 90s and um, just questioning social norms, questioning society, questioning the um, the idea of the Karen, all sorts of things that are just really, really astute and absolutely hilarious. I love Eliza Schlesinger. That led to, again, because of the coloring of the lettering, I listened to What You Wish For. So All Things Aside and What You Wish For both had white block lettering. Uh, and <clears throat> this was Catherine Center. This is my third Catherine Center book that I've read this year, uh, third Catherine Center that I've ever read. And this one I loved so much. It is about a librarian in a school and it's about school community and it's about school shootings and it is about fear and hope and being alive. There's a huge scene at the end with a whale and it's so wonderful. Um, yes, an actual whale. I just loved it. I just absolutely loved it. Love Catherine Sinner. I, she is a new absolute favorite author of mine. From there, I went on to reading, what did I do this one? Pink flower. So the pink flower in the background of what you wish for matched the pink background of this one. Uh, this was The Quarantine Princess by Meg Cabot. So I have been keeping up with all of the Princess Diaries books as she just kind of randomly releases one here and there. And this one was Quarantine Princess. So it was all about COVID. And at first I was like, I am not reading that. But I love the Princess Diaries books. I love them. I, I just absolutely love them. And I was curious how she was going to go about it. And it's the best book I've read about the, the pandemic yet. Um, I am not one. I know a lot of people take a lot of comfort or find a lot of joy in reading about the pandemic and seeing it like work its way into our literature. I think I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it at all. At all, at all, at all. I don't want it in my literature. I don't want it in my TV shows. Um, it's too new. It's too soon. We haven't processed it yet. We haven't come to any real conclusions. 
lessons or knowledge about it yet. It doesn't belong yet in our literature. That's my take on it. <laughs> but, but the one exception <laughs> is uh, The Quarantine Princess, which was so funny, but so it was like such a time capsule because it's the diary of a woman who is living through it as it unfolds. And so there are like references to music that that was really popular at the, in that moment, sourdough starters, like just TV shows that came out, things that you got to watch online that you wouldn't normally get to watch online. Like all of these things that were so life-saving for us in the moment, they're all in here. And yet it's also just so farcical because it is the Princess Diaries. So it's just a really, really great take. And uh, I think that if anybody 20, 30, 40 years from now wants to know what life was like in the pandemic, this is the book I'm going to recommend for them. That led to, so this is a cartoon cover. And the next book I read was a cartoon cover. I loved this next book so much and it surprised me so much how much I loved it. Uh, this is a romance and it's called Kit McBride Gets a Wife by Amy Berry. This book is just a delight. It's just an absolute delight. The premise is this, there is this huge family. And so we're going to get one book for each of the people, each of the family members, most of them boys, there's only one girl. And the story is told this one is told through the eyes of the youngest, the sister, the girl. So she has the weight of caring for all of her brothers, mother died and multiple female siblings have all died father is dead and so she is taking care of all of her male siblings and they're a rough and rowdy montana kind of crowd and she is also rough and rowdy they want her to grow up to be a lady but they don't know how to make that happen she wants female companionship she's very lonely and she loves her brothers dearly and she understands the their shortcomings and their limitations in meeting needs that she has as a as a young woman. And so she also has a side business <laughs> where she writes letters for people because she can read and write and a lot of the miners in the area cannot. And so she writes letters for them. Well, one day, one day a miner comes in and wants her to respond to an advertisement um, this minor sees this advertisement saying, I want a husband. This is who I am. Contact me. And so she writes that letter, but she also gets an idea. She thinks if I pretend to be one of my brothers and write to one of these women who's advertising that they would like to come West as someone's wife, then I can pick my own female companion, get her to come out here. I'll pick somebody who uh, knows what my brothers are like and wants to marry them anyway, but I will also pick someone who I like, and I will also pick someone who I think they will like, and then they'll fall in love and they'll get married and I'll have my companion. I'm sure you can imagine how much chaos this will cause. And it's so much fun. This book was so much fun. I just smiled the whole time I listened to it. Absolutely, absolutely loved it. Already have the second one on hold. I want to listen to the second one as well. The next one, uh, so there's a horizon in this image. So the next one is also horizon oriented. That was someone else's bucket list. This one has such a great premise and just, I did, I just didn't get into it. Uh, I did finish it though, cause I wanted to know what would happen. But the premise of this one is that uh, the main character's sister dies of cancer. She was an influencer, but she didn't have money uh, and her cancer treatment sucked the entire family dry. And so she, before she dies, she makes some, she signs some contracts with uh, some sponsors and she says, my sister will finish my bucket list. And if she does that, then, you know, you'll pay for all of the things that are necessary to finish this bucket list, but also you'll pay off all of my, my cancer um, treatment debt that my family incurs. And so her sister, who is not like her at all and doesn't want to finish this bucket list, feels trapped into finishing this bucket list. And so very reluctantly goes about 
finishing the bucket list. That was all, that was great. But the character herself is so, ugh, I just could not, ugh, I just did not like this character at all, at all, at all, at all. And uh, I wanted to know how it ended for the dead girl. <laughs> I didn't care how it ended for the living girl, um, which is a problem. It's a problem. So that was kind of a, meh, but I got to the end of it. And then everything kind of went out the window with kind of trying to match things because my Riley Sager hold came in and I just listened to that. I listened to the whole thing in one day and it was a phenomenal experience. So the only one left came in and I absolutely loved this one. Yeah, it, it has all the things. It has all the things that Jenna loves. It is about a young caretaker. She's not a nurse, but she's a, a trained caretaker who gets hired to take care of this woman who town lore says killed her entire family, but she was never convicted of it. She's stuck in a body that doesn't work, but her brain works and she can move her left hand. The caretaker is told this is due to polio and strokes and things that have happened um, in her past. There's a housekeeper, creepy housekeeper. The house itself is crooked. The house is crooked because it's sitting on a cliffside overlooking the ocean and it's constantly shifting this house. There's a little bit of mystery, a little bit of romance, a little bit of terror. Uh, there are moments where you're like, is there some sort of supernatural element going on? But you know it's Riley Sager, so you know it's not supernatural. And it just is so, so, so good. And there are certain things that I figured out and knew like at the get-go. I think that they were obvious things. Maybe they aren't, but I feel, really feel like they were obvious. And then there are things that are revealed in the end that I didn't. I didn't know. I highly suggest that you read this start to finish in one sitting because it was... Mm, it was so good. It was so good for that. So now we get into physical reads. Physical reads. Uh, I got through so many books off of my TBR, off of my shelves this month by mood reading. So the first book that I did show you at the beginning of the month or in my TBR that I read was Dragonwick by Anya Seton. And I loved this so much. Anya Seton's writing is just so great. It's incredibly readable. It's enchanting. It's history. Basically, the basic premise is there's this girl and she's got a distant cousin by marriage who invites her. He's not actually blood related to her. He invites her to his home because she's from a family with lots and lots and lots of children and they're poor. He has one child and is very, very rich. And he would like to invite her to come and be raised and enter society. This is the 1830s in upstate New York. He would like her to come so that she can enter society as a wealthy girl with lots of prospects. And the family, she kind of um, manipulates the family into letting her do this because they are religious. They weren't going to let her go. They think that it's not a good idea. They're wise. And so she ends up going, his wife mysteriously dies shortly after her arrival, and then they get engaged. And woo, this like, if you like Rebecca, if you like Jane Eyre, if you like those kinds of gothic tales, this is a book for you. This scratched such an itch. Um, absolutely loved it. So yeah, that's, that's Dragonwick. Dragon Wick had some flowers on the cover, so I picked up this one, which also had some flowerish foliage things on the cover. This is Lucy Worsley's biography of Agatha Christie, an elusive woman. Lucy Worsley, you can do no wrong. I love you. I love Lucy Worsley. She has written a beautiful, compelling biography of a woman, make you empathize with her. And Agatha Christie is kind of an atrocious human being. And I didn't know that. Um, she, I mean, she's a product of her time. She's not an atrocious human being. She just makes a lot of choices that are really motivated by what was acceptable and um, encouraged in her time. Like she doesn't have a great relationship with her children because other people raise them. She is emotionally unstable. She's a manipulator. She is anti-Semitic. Um, she is, she marries a younger man 
and that younger man is an archaeologist and he himself is responsible through her patronage for kind of the sacking of different <laughs> archaeological sites in Iran and the stealing of a lot of cultural heritage products. But you know, this was like the thing that was done at the time. All of these things are things that were done by the elite acceptable society members of her time. Yeah, she's she's a rough woman to love, but <laughs> but this this biography does such a good job of presenting those sides of her while also showing the places where she was broken and vulnerable and kind and loyal. Yeah, she's a complicated human being like all of us and this book presents that. That's what I will say. I loved the reading experience of it. Again, Lucy Worsley, you can do no wrong. I love you. I love you, Lucy Worsley. Thank you. I know she doesn't watch these videos, but if she ever did, if she ever accidentally came upon it, just Lucy, no, I love you. You are my favorite historian on the planet. Um, that led to this book. So uh, on the cover of this one, you've got the author's title at the top. I mean, and the, um, title of the book at the bottom. <laughs> Reaching me? No, not never. So I finally read The Last Summer, which I got last year, and it was on a TBR in the summer, and I didn't get to it. Um, and so I finally read it. And this is Karen Swan's The Last Summer. And I picked it because it has the author's name at the top and the name of the book at the bottom. And this was, it started out strong um, and I really enjoyed it, but it, it's very atmospheric. I loved the characters. The romance was not really my thing. I did not like what was happening with that whole storyline. It's the first in a series. I probably won't pick up the rest of the books in the series. I loved the main character, especially at the beginning as they were kind of establishing who she was because she's a cliff climber and she does it like free like in the 1940s and skirts and stuff. <laughs> she's just, she's amazing. And just the story itself though, it got a little bit dull. It got a little bit boring. It looks like a super huge book, but it's got like middle grade size letters. <laughs> so it reads very quickly. Um, yeah, it was, it was okay. It was okay. I'm sure a lot of people would really enjoy it more than I did. For me, it was just okay. The next book that I picked up, I picked up because that book, this book has a boat on it. And so does this one, The Forever Sea. This is another one that I tried to read last summer, but didn't get to. Um, and so finally picked it up. And I have to say, I think this is a book that will stick with me for a long time but I don't think it's a series that I want to continue reading. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll pick up the next one. Maybe I won't. The first two thirds of it, I was so enamored. It was so interesting. And I was so curious about what was going on. The basic premise is that you've got this main character named Kindred. And she is a story that is being told by some man or shadow thing <laughs> to a group of people who are like living in the dark. You don't really know what's going on. Like there's, this is a story within a story story. And so the story within the story is about Kindred and she can make the, the fires that, <sighs> this isn't making any sense <laughs> because it doesn't make sense in our world. In this world, there are prairies and there are boats that magically float through these prairies and there are people who go out to collect different herbs and, and growth from these prairies and bring them back to make medicines and foods and things like that that people need who live on land in cities. And the boats go through the prairies by consuming fire and fire is made through bone and spells, songs. And so Kindred can work this fire, these songs, these bones, and manipulate the boats using different configurations of these things. So that that's kind of the start of the story. But you also know that she worked on a boat that was run by her grandmother. 
and she got kind of, she either left or got kicked off that boat. And so she's on a different boat trying to prove herself. But her grandmother used different, she didn't use prescribed like casting of things. It wasn't a scientific thing for her. It was more of a touchy feely sort of thing. And that doesn't fly on this boat. Well, it does for maybe the captain, but for the person who's training her, it doesn't fly. On this boat. There's also constantly the threat of pirates, lack of water. There are certain springs belonging to holy sites. Water gets sold. People who run the ships have guaranteed access to water because they are the people who provide the herbs and the medicines and things. But there's a person who's got a monopoly now on all the water sources. And that person wants all of the ships to join their confederation but that would mean that you that most of your earnings would go to the protection to paying for the protection of this federation the protection so this is the basic premise of what's going on and it's just a story about how that's all unfolding and what's going and what's happening and what's going on and there's like a love story and stuff like that and i was really into it for the first two thirds it sounds fascinating it is fascinating it's very atmospheric writing it's very like enchanting and then for some reason, <laughs> the like final third of the book, I was just like, is this over yet? I can't believe we're having another pirate chase. What's going on? Um, yeah, it just got a little, I don't, I don't know if it got repetitive or if I just lost steam. I don't know. Um, that book had foliage on the cover. So I went for another foliage on the cover book and I picked up Karen Joy Fowler's Booth. Booth may be my favorite read of the year. I can't imagine enjoying another book as much as I enjoyed this one. Now, come at me with books that I'll enjoy more because that would be a fine statement to have to topple. Um, but I loved this book so much. It is about, okay, let's say this. It's historical fiction, but it's written in the present tense. And sometimes the fourth wall is broken and it's and the speaker speaks directly to you about what will happen in the future and the future is the reader's present and that's so powerful because this book is a little bit of a morality tale about active shooters so we know that john wilkes booth is the person who assassinated lincoln and so it's the story of that family it does not center john wilkes booth and it does not center Lincoln. Lincoln is in the periphery. Sometimes we get like a page from his perspective of things that are going on. We get little snippets. Each section begins with a quote. Sometimes those quotes are from him. But for the most part, Lincoln and John Wilkes Booth barely factor. They barely factor into this story. It's really about the family, the Booth family and Shakespeare. <laughs> It's so good. I can't even tell you. The writing is just phenomenal. You feel so much empathy for these characters. It's very poetic, but not, but inclusive. It includes the reader. And Shakespeare is everywhere in it. So Karen Joy Fowler has done this amazing job of just working in words and lines and phrases into her voice in this as the narrator in this book and as you're reading you're like oh that sounds to, like the phrases like the moon is down um like they're just in there they're just part of the of the narrative as if she's written it herself so shakespeare is everywhere in here because the father was a shakespearean actor it all starts with the father and the mother acting is such a huge thing in the booth family it is their salvation and their obsession and their shame all at the same time. It's just, it's such a complex, engrossing read. It had, oh, hi. Hello. Hello. How are you? It had birds all over the cover. And so I picked up another book off my shelf, long time TBR vet that had a lot of things all over the cover. 
fruit <laughs> all over the cover. I read Elizabeth Acevedo's With the Fire on High. Now I'd read The Poet X and I read Clap When You Land. And I even have lore on my Kindle and I've read about a third of it, but I haven't read the whole thing, but I had never, I had this on my shelf and I had never read it uh, with Fire and High. I've recommended it to people, but I had never read it. Um, and don't, don't laugh at me, you know you do that too. <laughs> but I had never read it. It's so good. It's so good. It is about a high school senior, single mom, living with her grandmother, wanting to find her place in the world. She's obsessed with and really good at cooking. And she has an opportunity to take a cooking class at her school that includes a trip to Spain. And it's just how she, it's a year in her life. It's just a year in her life and what happens and how that's difficult and like all the aspects of her life are difficult, but also rewarding even when everything is falling apart. It's just so good. It's a really, really great book. Um, if you enjoy Elizabeth Osvedo and you have that on yourself and you haven't read it yet, but you've recommended it to people, <laughs> pull that book off your shelf and read it. It's really, really good. Um, the next book that I picked to read, oh, was Trials of the Earth, which I haven't finished yet, which I showed you. And that was because it had a woman on it. And then um, it has a woman in silhouette on it. Let me find it. Yeah, I haven't finished it yet, but it has a woman in silhouette on it. Um, and so does this copy, this cover of the next book I read. My copy doesn't have that. <laughs> um, this is Sophie's Heart by Lori Wick. I read this uh, in college for the first time in the 1990s and uh, it was written in the 1980s, I think 1988, and you can feel it. <laughs> you can feel, uh, yeah, you, it's, just, it's just got that, um, that air about it, the 1980s. It is a uh, Christian fiction. It's a Christian romance, a contemporary, even though it's 1980s, Christian romance uh, about a young immigrant woman. And she, her name is Sophie, obviously. And she wins. She's from Czechoslovakia, which doesn't exist anymore, but did back then. Um, she wins a green card lottery and she has to leave her grandmother behind. So she leaves her grandmother behind, comes to the States and because her English isn't great, the only job that she can get is working fast food. She goes to church, she meets a woman whose brother-in-law has just lost his wife. He is raising three kids on his own and she thinks that he could use a housekeeper and she loves Sophie. So she convinces the brother and Sophie to meet. The brother hires Sophie as the housekeeper and you can see where things are going from there. The thing about Sophie, though, is that she speaks four languages. English is her fifth not great language, but everything else she speaks absolutely fluently. She used to work as a translator for the government, and she's been reduced to servitude, basically, in the States. She's a very smart woman. She's courageous and stubborn, and you just fall so in love with her. I remember this book as being one of my favorite books from that time in my life. I had never picked it up again. This is only the second time I've ever read it. And I understand why it stuck with me all these years, decades it stuck with me after one read because that character of Sophie is so dynamic and so real. I feel like she's somebody that I know. And I just, I really, really loved the character development of that character. Now the romance in here, a little lackluster, very like, business-like to the point where the book even mentions how business-like it is. And that's obviously a choice on Laurie Wick's part. That's the story she wanted for Sophie. I wanted something more for Sophie. It's very apparent that Laurie Wick is capable of writing incredibly emotionally complex characters because she does it in this book. And the guy who's the love interest just isn't one of those. He just fell totally flat for me. But that's okay. There's also some stuff in here that may annoy you, like references to women not they shouldn't wear pants things like that Sophie wears pants but like she gets criticized for it like there's just there's just some things in here that are just not part of my belief system so this is a love-hate book for me it's not the kind of book that I want to go around recommending to people because there are things in here that I think might be detrimental to some people's like self-worth and view 
And then there are some things in here that are just so wonderfully, perfectly, awesomely done. Sophie's Heart. I'm not sorry I reread it. I really, really, really enjoyed my time with it. At the same time, I cringed through like a third of it. <laughs> not one particular third part of it, but like a third of it across the whole board. Um, from there, I picked up another Christian romance. Hope's Highest Mountain by Misty M. Beller. This is my first book by Beller. I probably won't continue this series, but I might continue this series. It has more than 30 chapters, and in every single chapter, something catastrophic happened. <laughs> it was a little over the top. There are snakes and wagons and avalanches and wells and coyotes and sicknesses and lost people and it's just like every single chapter something genuinely catastrophic happens until you get to the epilogue and it was just a little bit much <laughs> um also the two main characters fall deeply madly and passionately in love in less than 72 hours of knowing each other <laughs> There's just a lot going on in this book at very high speed. It's a high octane Christian historical romance. <laughs> and so I don't know if I have what it takes to continue on with the series, but it was enjoyable. I read it in like an afternoon and a half. It was enjoyable, easy read. It would make a great airplane or airport read if you get have like a three hour layover. You could get through one of these if it doesn't make you too anxious. Wow. High octane. High, high octane. <laughs> from there, I picked up for no good reason, no connection from the, from this cover to this. I picked up A Demon Haunted Land uh, by Monica Black. And this is so interesting to me. I, as a person who's read just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books about and that is not an overstatement, it's not hyperbole, um, about the Holocaust. Th this was a very unique take on it. So it's post-Holocaust Germany, and it's looking at the psychological and emotional effects that being a, a member of that nation, no matter what role you served, impact the nation as a whole following the experiences of everyone there during the war. It talks about the groups of people who cannot admit guilt and why psychologically that is a thing. It talks about the people who are still looking for a leader. It talks about the, or like any kind of group, any kind of anybody that will tell them what to do, uh, that they can worship. It talks about the massive amounts of sickness that came about following and, the, and how psychosomatic they were. It talks about the rise of faith healers and witchcraft in post-World War II. And it talks particularly about one faith healer, but it, it covers the concept. And it talks about all of this within the context of mass guilt, mass denial, and mass lack of identity. Um, it was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And I highly recommend it if you are interested in World War II history or faith healers or the psychology of groups. Incredibly interesting. That's A Demon Haunted Land by Monica Black. Um, yeah, that's my wrap up. I'm starting to remember why I don't like traditional wrap up videos. <laughs> they go on forever. I don't feel like I say much of anything. But, um, but in this one, I got to reveal to you all the things that I did read, and I got through an awful lot of books for such a busy month, and a lot of them were really great. What is probably going to be my favorite book of the year, Karen Joy Fowler's Booth. That's all I got, people. That's all I got. Let's go read. <laughs>